In the 1950s and, and around then, uh, you know, maybe 1960s, 70s, uh, we we would look at this as just we would we would we would look at projects like this, discounted cash flow valuation. You look at the cash flow, look at the risk of the cash flows, discount them back to today, and you know, with our net present value, decide whether we accept or reject. Right. So simple discounted cash uh, discounted cash flow valuations. What we realized afterwards is, or later is in many of these things that we're looking at, there are actually options. Okay. So there are a lot of options. Uh, this, of course, coincides with 1973 when we get the Black-Scholes option pricing. Okay. So 1973, we finally had a way to value options where we didn't really have a good way to value options prior to that. So uh, we start to be able to value options, uh, and then we start realizing that all these other things behave as if they are, are options. So we have to value them as if they are options. The idea of um, uh, sort of going to the option analogy is, do we know what a, like a call option on a, on a stock is? So a call option will give me the right to buy something at a set price uh, at some set date. Right? So in other words, uh, you know, I might have the right, you know, so the right to buy one share of Tesla at you know two hundred dollars per share. It could be a European option, which is on a particular date or any time before a particular date. I'll just say you know on July first. Now the idea here is we pay some amount for this option. Right, and let's say, let's say theoretically. Let me ask you. Let me let me ask. You, I'll ask you this. Let's say right now it's not actually Tesla's below 200 right now, but uh, but I, I'm gonna I'm gonna go with this. Let's say right now today, Tesla uh, tr uh, Tesla trades for 210 dollars. Now in investments, I prove. Uh, uh, that the option has to trade for greater than ten dollars. Well, let me say um, uh, any time before, any time before seven one. So let me ask you a question: uh, Could the option? This is really true. Could the option price be um, less than ten dollars? If this is the option, and this is what Tesla is trading for today, and you can exercise this option today, you can exercise your right today, could it trade for less than $10? No, why not? It's arbitrage. It's ar yeah, absolutely, it's an arbitrage. What would, what would the arbitrage be? Well, you would just buy as many options as possible and then trade them in right away because. Uh, and keep that profit between two. Absolutely. So let's we do, we do it for one. You're right. We do it for as many as we possibly could. But the idea is, let's say what, let's say an option is nine dollars. Yeah, you keep that dollar then. Yeah. You know, so we pay nine dollars for an option. We buy it, then we immediately exercise it. We exercise it and get ten dollars. So for every option we do this, we get a uh, um, dollar. We do this for. You absolutely correctly say we do this for as many options as we possibly can. Um, what's going to happen when we do this for as many options as we possibly can? Obviously, we're bidding. We have to buy options. We bid up the option price. We'll bid this up until it hits ten. Now the question is, um, could the option price be equal to ten? I'm confused. On that. So this is. Like the ten is throwing me off here. Like, what's that mean? Option price of ten dollars. So this. This is a right. You, the, I can give you a contract that says you have the right to buy one share of Tesla at two hundred dollars per share. Um, I read the wrong, wrong place. Any time before uh, July first. Okay. That right, you paid me ten dollars for that right. So that's what the price is for that right. So I pay you ten dollars just to be able to buy it two hundred. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So you're paying. This is for the right to buy shares in Tesla. So the idea is, obviously, uh, you will. Uh, the price of this option can't be nine dollars, 
right? Because again, you would be very happy to pay me uh, $9 for that right because you would buy the right and immediately exercise. That right is worth $10. So what we would say, uh, if this is the case, the, I, the option gives you the right to buy one share for $200. Tesla is at 210. We would say the intrinsic value Uh, the intrinsic value of a, a call option, we don't have to get too much involved. Well, your project is going to go into this, but it's the stock price minus the strike price is zero. So the intrinsic value here is equal to $10. So this is what you get if you exercise the option. So in other words, if you exercise the option, you get $10. So we know uh, the, the price of the option has to be 10 or greater. Like the company knows that. Well, this, is just a this option is just a contract between me and you. It has nothing to do with the company. The company is not involved. I just, I'm going to say right now, I want to sell you the right to buy Tesla at $10. I'm obviously not going to sell you that right for anything less than $10 because if I sell you that right, you can immediately exercise it and, you know, you for $10 and get $10. Okay, okay. <laughs> uh, so I won't sell it. Uh, so now the only question is, would you, would I sell it for $10? Would I sell it exactly for its intrinsic value? And this, this, there's a, you know, I have to prove this, right? And I, I can prove it, um, uh, I can prove it by arbitrage. And what I can show you is actually the price has to be greater than uh, uh, 210 minus the present value of the strike price, right? So the present value to it. So that means it has to be greater than 10. But then uh, uh, I can show you in, in uh, because it's investment, so I won't, or if anyone's interested, I'll, I'll just sit here and prove this stuff. But uh, for right now, what you can do is trust me a little bit and say the option price has to be greater than 10. It has to be greater. But before expiration, the option price is greater than its intrinsic value. A way you can think about this, and there's a proper arbitrage arguments uh, for this, however, is this. And this is actually the way the, the argument goes in the arbitrage. I can set up one uh, position, that, one portfolio that always dominates another. So, uh, but the idea is this: if the if it was ten dollars, right, and you bought this option, then the intrinsic and the stock went up by one dollar, you would make uh, one dollar, right? So you know the intrinsic went from ten to eleven. So you buy this at ten, the option, the stock was up by one dollar, you now have eleven dollars. Does that make sense? Or you can buy the stock um, for let me see what did I said Tesla's at two ten. Or you could buy the stock for two ten, and it goes up by one dollar, and you make one dollar. Does that make sense? So if you buy the option for the stock, and the stock goes up by a dollar, you, know, you make a dollar. Uh, um, uh, in other words, you know, in terms of intrinsic value and in terms of the value of your position here. Does that make sense? Now let me ask you a question. If you buy the stock for 210 and it goes down to 100, how much do you lose? 110 dollars. If you buy the option and it goes down to 100, uh, it goes down to 100, how much do you lose? You bought the option for, let's just say $10. You bought the, you know, this is equal, you bought the option for 10. If the stock goes down to 100, how much do you lose? $10. Does that make sense? So in other words, what you can see here is the option gives you what the option effectively does, and this is important for capital budgeting, and for what we're going to talk about here, is the option cuts your downside. You have the upside, but we cut your downside. Does that make sense? So you can only lose up until a certain point and then you don't lose any more. So the idea is that's why you're willing to pay more for the option than purely its intrinsic value. Because I'm going to, what this is, it's like a position of the stock, but I can't lose more than, you know, if the stock falls to 200, I don't care anymore. When it falls, because the strike price, the rate at which I can buy this stock is 200. So in other words, from an option perspective, I don't care if it falls to 199 or 100 or 50 or $1. Because at all of those prices, the intrinsic value, what I can exercise the option for is the same. Does that make sense? So for compensation for getting rid of this downside, I pay more than 10. Does that make sense? That's, uh, and we can set up a portfolio that will show that formally. Show that um, you, uh, if the option price was 10, I could, I could show one portfolio which dominates another, which always has a better return in all states of the world, in, in which case no one would buy the the, the um, portfolio. You could arbitrage. You could, you could uh, buy one and sell another. Uh, so the idea of this is uh, useful in projects, in, in, in capital budgeting. 
So in other words, how, how, how does this have any relevance to, to capital budgeting? One, um, well, what, when we use discounted cash flow valuation, you can look at that as just the intrinsic value. It doesn't take into account the fact that we can do stuff, right? Um, uh, in other words, like, like this option, uh, the value takes into account the, the, the option price is always greater than the intrinsic value because uh, in the option I have limited downside. So the question is, in any of these capital budgeting projects, is there a way for us to limit our downside to get something like an option? And the answer is absolutely. In other words, let's say we have some capital budgeting, we have some capital budgeting problem. And you know, in the upstate, this will be a, a brief example, but this is some capital budgeting, and there's some probability of a, you know, an upstate or a probability of a downstate. And in the upstate, you know, our the cost for the project costs five hundred dollars. Upstate and downstate, right? Cost doesn't change. But in the downstate, right? So this is you know macroeconomic events. You know, I'm building the Apple Watch, and maybe it hits or maybe it doesn't. Right? So there's two possible events that can happen. In the downstate, I lose one hundred. You know, or let's say I you know I make ten. I don't know. Maybe I lose. Uh, I'll just gonna say I make ten. Right? Ten, ten, ten. Out for three years. Negative net present value, horrible investment, right? Um, well, you know, uh, let me see. Uh, you know, I, actually, I can't have that something like that. Um, let me. I got. I have to have something like negative one hundred, negative one hundred. Um, uh, maybe one hundred, one hundred, or something like this. The idea here is uh, then you know this really works out. So this is going to be you know uh, one thousand for each of these years. So this is net present value positive. The idea of, of including options in capital budgeting, one way to think of including options in capital budgeting is if I hit this down state, so I'll know what the, what state I'm in by year one. Right? What would you do? This isn't necessarily a great example. Uh, I mean, if I did this, let me do that. I'll make them all negative. And then it's really, you know, the example works very well. In other words, you know by time one that you're in a down state. So do you continue on here? In other words, you cut your losses. So what, what I would say is, well, including an option, I don't incur these. So it's really this with this net present value, not this with this net present value. Does that make sense? Because I close the project down and I sell things off. Now, actually, um, what I can say, however, is, uh, maybe I can sell the, you know, so uh, continuing uh, making this example a little bit better. Uh, in this state, if I close my project now, I could sell my equipment. Right? So in other words, maybe, um, you know, this equipment, let's say it depre it's, it's worth zero out, you know, in, in three years. But if I can sell it here, then maybe I'll get plus 100 just from selling the equipment. Does that make sense? So in other words, what you have to do is you have to sit here and say, uh, and I, there may be an exam question like this, and we'll go through a couple, but you have to sit there and say, okay, this is the net present value if I close it in year one. This is the net present value if I close it in year two. This is the net present value if I close it in year three in the downstate. And see which, um, uh, you know, you'll find the optimal time to close the investment. In this case, obviously, if this is a zero cash inflows later, it would be optimal for you to close in year one. But the idea here is um, what we'll do is we'll take, let's say, Theoretically, and again, I'll make it. We'll do proper numbers in a second. But let's say the net present value in the down state, uh, uh, in the high state, and net present value in the low state is equal to, let's say, high state. It's equal to 600, and then a down state here. What's this going to be? 500. Uh, let's just say it's negative 750. So this would be not including the option. So I, I say this is a probability, a certain probability of a certain probability. And that gives me you know, what I expect the net present value to be. Does that make sense? I say uh, this net present value times the probability. You know, so if this is 50%, what I would say is you know, the net present value of my project is equal to 0.5 times 600. If there's an equal chance of these minus uh, 0.5 times 750. And that would give me my my project value by discounted cash flow valuation. 
However, if I recognize that I have an option to discontinue this project at this point, then if I consider that I have this option, then this cash flow might change to, okay, well, now this cash flow is negative, let's say I have a plus 100 here, maybe that's negative 400. So now I say negative 400. And when I include the option, does the project look better or worse? Is that my net present value higher or lower? This is 750 here, 400 there. It's higher. It's higher, right? So in other words, when I include this option, it's, I'm always going to get a higher value. The option always has a, one thing to keep in mind is because the option intrinsic is the maximum of, uh, maximum of some value in zero, the option value is always positive. So when I start including option values, it always makes my net present values go up. I'll never include an option and it'll make my net present value go down. Does that make sense? So we'll run through a couple examples like this. This would be the option to, you know, shut down the project. You can also have the option to expand the project. These are interesting. But I've kind of gone through this example quick because, I didn't, you know, this isn't, this isn't that important to me. It, it's important for you to understand. Uh, but what I want you to understand is, um, the options show up in other places. So the textbook examples are the option to expand and the option to shut down the project. Very real, very accurate, very good examples, right? However, uh, when I was doing capital budgeting, uh, working at a company, I never, I never did something like this, right? However, in your project, can you, can you remind me of what your project is? In your project, what are you valuing? So in your project, you will deal with real options you know, there. Um, and this is, I, I might say, a, a case like you might see it while working as an analyst, or at least that's how I did. Your, your, your project is to value a power plant or a, a, a financial transmission rate, the right to transmit electricity between two places in the